this is Mike and you're listening to Feeling Twisty. I'm really glad you're here. It's funny, just before I started recording today's episode, I realized today's date. It's the 25th anniversary of the day I proposed to Kim. In this episode, I'm going to take you back a couple of years before I met the love of my life. This is about the time I was really diving into Dr. Joseph Murphy. (laughs) This is when the Neville Hardliners, uh, (laughs) friends of mine, will be saying, Oh, what's Mike doing mentioning another teacher? (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Way back in episode 28, uh, it's titled, How I Got My Bachelor's Degree in Eight Short Years. I told you about how I employed my imagination to go from near academic probation because of my low grades to graduating with honors. And back then, as I was testing my imagination and proved it in performance with my grades, I began playing in other ways. One night, as I was lying in bed, I was thinking about being married and being in love. I wasn't dating anyone at the time, and I really hadn't had any success in that area of my life. So lying there in bed, before I drifted off to sleep, I created a scene that implies I'm in love and happily married. Now at the time, I wouldn't have used the words imagination or anything familiar that you might be familiar with if you really stick with Neville, at least not Neville in his later years. Back then, back in the early 90s, I would have told you, I'm visualizing to impress my subconscious. I imagined I was driving a car down a street, down of one of our streets. Common Street is the name of it. As I drove, I felt the steering wheel in my hands and looked over to my right to see the love of my life sitting in the passenger seat. Now, at the time, I did not know Kim. So when I say love of my life, it was that feeling that that person with me is the love of my life. And in that little scene, I even noticed the cream-colored upholstery in the car. It was a small car. I didn't see her face. I didn't have a face to put there yet. But I did see her small frame and blonde curls. And I heard her laugh. And I felt the reality of being in love, being loved, and being married. And I drifted off to sleep in that state. Around the same time, I was thinking about how I wanted a big family to go with this happily married state. Again, I wouldn't have used the word state because that's not the way I saw things back then. I was all about impressing and reprogramming the subconscious. But it doesn't really matter. It comes down to what you believe to be true. Anyway, as I was drifting off to sleep, I put myself, this time behind the wheel of an SUV, like a Suburban. As I drove down the street, I listened to the chatter and laughter behind me, coming from five kids in the back seats, my five kids. Well, that eventually happened too, even though Kim insisted that it was only going to be two kids. That's all she wanted. I didn't imagine either scene again. I already knew from my experience with the grades that I didn't have to keep redoing the scene. Only trust that it's done. And I didn't have any desire to date anyone at the time I imagined it. I was too busy with school. Well, the college semesters went on and no girlfriend, no hint of my little imaginal act coming true. Two years later, during my final year in school, I found out when I went to register for my classes that I was missing three credit hours, which is one class, on a course that I should have taken years before a simple geography class, and the only one available at the time was a night class. So I signed up for it. I had no choice, really. And that is when I saw Kim, across the classroom, this petite, blonde-haired, curly-haired girl who seemed to be the most popular one in the classroom. I've never used this word before, but I I was smitten. I was done in. That was it for me. I knew this was the woman I was going to spend my life with. I had only chatted with her a few times, but I knew 
I knew, I knew, I knew that this was it. She was the one for me. Now, she wasn't thinking that far ahead, but she did like me. She was interested in me. Two and a half months later, I proposed to her, December 7th, 1995. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> About a month after the engagement, she started to have second thoughts, got a little nervous. Well, it threw me for a loop. I mean, I totally understand it. That was really quick. We'd met in September, engaged in December, set to be married that following June. I would like to tell you that when she told me she was having second thoughts, that I was completely unbothered, but that would be a lie. I had a moment, several moments, of feeling devastated, like a real kick in the gut. I went to my parents' house that night, crying my eyes out. Oh, Mom, Dad, listen to what happened. She's, she doesn't love me. All of these awful feelings and thoughts rolling around inside me. And I told my mom, but I deserve to be loved, don't I? Don't I deserve it? Why doesn't Kim see it that way? Stuff like that. My mom did what moms do and hugged me and consoled me. But one thing she told me did the trick. She told me to back off. Let Kim be Kim. It doesn't matter if she isn't the one. It was like cold water on my face, but it, it worked. It snapped me out of that. It's exactly what I needed to hear. So I took my mother's advice and I backed off. I wouldn't have called it getting back into the state of my wish fulfilled back then because I didn't know that term. I didn't think like that. Like I said, I'd never heard of Neville, but that's, that's what I did. I got back into the state of my wish fulfilled. I got back into that warm, fulfilling feeling of being loved and in a loving relationship. As I did that, as I brought those feelings back up, the feeling of it must be Kim, it has to be this person, withered away. I didn't make a conscious effort to let it go. But by moving into that state, that desperation, that need for it to be her, dried up. Oh, it was a marvelous feeling. I felt strong and solid and confident, sure of myself, certain that my wish was fulfilled. Again, not insisting that it had to be her. I just got back into that state that loving and loved state. Within a few days, we were back together and we got married six months later. We were a couple of years and a couple of children into our marriage when we bought a new car, a Mitsubishi Galant. Kim and I were driving down that same street, Common Street, that I had driven down in that imaginal act several years before when I had a moment of deja vu. I had experienced this exact moment in imagination years before. Kim was even wearing the same clothes and the interior of the car was exactly what I imagined. But now I have a face with that beautiful laugh and those beautiful blonde curls. One would think that that would be enough to get me to go all out and live by imagination from that point on, right? But no, I didn't. <laughs> what it comes down to is that I, I didn't really get who I am. I had never heard of me being the operant power and me being the one cause. Back then, I was all about pointing my finger at and reacting to secondary causes. It's their fault and her fault and his fault and those damn kids. <laughs> I was still feeling myself, imagining myself to be small and separate, fighting my way through life, fighting to get the money, fighting to get the happiness. It would be years later that I would remember, really remember who I am and really understand that I am the operant power. Back then, before we got married, I didn't manipulate Kim, not at all. I could have tried. <laughs> I can only experience the result of my state. And Kim reflected that. 
Had she been turned off by me or avoided me or didn't pick up the phone when I called, we didn't have cell phones or Facebook or Instagram back then, that would have still been a reflection of my state. So when I'm asked about specific persons, I'll never tell you to not give up on that man or that woman or talk to you about worrying about them being hot or cold to you. They replied to my text with a thumbs up. What does that mean? Do they like me? Do they not? Did I do my scene right? I'm going to tell you what I know from firsthand experience. Change your state. Change your state of mind. You will only experience what you are imagining, what you accept is true. Your actions, reactions, thoughts, that desperation, calmness, confidence, all come through you in varying degrees based on the state you're in, based on your inner conversation. And that inner conversation is going on all the time. Your inner conversation, which I talked about in the last episode, mental diets, that's the, the same thing. It's not something you sit down and do three times a day or whatever. There's no prescription for it, no regimen for inner conversations. It's what's going on, this program running all the time. Most of the time, we don't even notice it. You might be on your morning commute, not realizing the dread that your thoughts are focused on. Will he call? Will she reply? Oh, geez, what if they don't answer? Or what if they do answer, but it's with some vague response? Always looking toward the outside for reinforcement and confirmation that we're on the right track. Pay attention to your inner conversations, what you're thinking and feeling throughout the day. Stop and ask yourself, what am I thinking? What am I feeling right now? What am I imagining? What am, am I imagining about myself that I think I need one specific person to fulfill me? What can I possibly lack? What am I imagining that I'm lacking? If I, you know, I have to watch what I'm imagining. I check in with myself daily. If I let my imagination wander off, I'd be causing all kinds of mischief in my life. If I'd remained in that state of turmoil and confusion, insisting that it has to be Kim or no one else, my life is over, then it wouldn't have worked out as perfectly as it did. I still might have ended up with her. I might have coerced her into marrying me, but who wants to be with a guy like that? Or a woman like that? I would have tried forcing a loving, fulfilling relationship from that desperate state, and she and I would have been miserable. I kill and give life. I wound and I heal. I hate and I love. I cause the storm and I bring the peace. That's God talking. That's me. That's you. You might blame another for your feelings of desperation, but there is no cause for that desperation other than you, your own imagination. Like a good friend of mine told me the other day, that's a bitter pill, Mike. It's a bitter pill to accept that I am the only cause, that I am the operant power. I know. The good news is that none of this really matters. All of these debates over specific people, whether it should be only Neville or allow other teachers, <laughs> oh geez, religion or no religion, Democrats or Republicans, to mask or not to mask, will they or won't they love me? It just doesn't matter. But you know what? It doesn't matter if you think it does matter. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it just doesn't matter if you think it's important. That's cool. I used to too. And the things that I think are important or not so important now, you might think are vital to you, crucial. That's fine. Because it really doesn't matter. Even if you think it does. 
you don't have to agree with me. I'm often <laughs> talking with people who don't agree with me. I was even called a, a, a witch. Well, I don't know. Can I be a witch? I was told I was dabbling in witchcraft, so maybe I was a, uh, an apprentice. We'll all remember who and what we are eventually. And when you do, you'll agree with me then. You'll realize that even the labels we put on things like we use words like God, consciousness, awareness. These are all the ways we use to describe what we're experiencing. They're just symbols representing an experience. Why worry about the little things? And it's all little things, really. Everything is. When the whole world, the whole universe, everything is yours. And I love you. This is Feeling Twisty.